I was hearing them share their experience, their life experience, their thoughts, their perspectives about these atrocious things that had happened. And it got me thinking about all the times in my life that I've used a platform to educate public or that I've been a guest on a radio show to do interviews in the space of nutrition and omega-3s. And I realized through the course of doing this that I already had the skill set to do a podcast. Podcast Junkies, episode 272. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran. New listeners, welcome, welcome, welcome. Regular listeners, I appreciate you so much for coming back episode after episode and providing valuable feedback to me on how the episodes are resonating with you. And uh, it's not uh, feedback that I take lightly, so I really thank you and appreciate it. This is the show where we talk to interesting folks in podcasting and get them to kick back their heels and talk about their shows and anything else that's motivating them and inspiring them. Last week, we spoke with teachers Mealy and Tudisco, hosts of Unprofessional Development. They got to share their exciting story of how they started the show and the special interview they landed with Tony Danza, of all people. So make sure you check that episode out. Really inspirational. This week, I speak to Karina Belize. She's the host of Care More, Be Better, a social impact and sustainability podcast. She shares inspiring stories of people that are committed to social good. And in this episode, we engage in a meaningful examination of social impact and the growing need for positive change. Karina opens up about her podcast journey and how she formats her episodes and how she identifies which guests to interview. She takes this aspect of her show very seriously, and it's a really interesting deep dive into how much value she provides for her audience and how she thinks about these from the perspective of a podcast host. We also learn about her passion for cars, which I was surprised to hear about in a fun little detour. As a bit of a backstory, Karina and I engaged on LinkedIn a couple of months before this podcast aired. And in the beginning of the episode, I want you to listen out for how I challenged her to a goal that she subsequently met. And it's the reason why we're having this conversation. So that's really inspiring. And hope it'll inspire you to take the next step with your show. We've got a couple of words from our two sponsors for this episode, Focusrite and Patreon. So make sure you take a few moments to listen to those as we are appreciative of our sponsors. And it's a reminder how much we value them supporting the show and you listening as well, which is just as important. And then afterwards, it'll be the entire episode interview uninterrupted. Make sure you stay to the end of the episode where I reveal this week's retention hashtag as well. This episode is brought to you by Focusrite and specifically the Scarlet 2i2 sound card, one of my favorite go-to sound cards, something I use for each and every podcast recording. The 3G line is a go-to for all new podcasters. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite and the link will be in the show notes as well. This episode is brought to you by Patreon. Creating a successful podcast shouldn't involve compromising your vision. Over 25,000 independent podcasters have found a home on Patreon. And that's because at Patreon, people power your podcast, not advertisers or networks. On Patreon, your listeners subscribe to your show for access to exclusive benefits like ad-free episodes and bonus content. And in exchange, you earn reliable, predictable income independent of ads and network deals and a deeper relationship with the listeners who never miss an episode. You can build and grow your podcast your way without having to sacrifice your vision for the big guys. Start your Patreon today at patreon.com. And that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. So Corinna Belize, host of Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. Thank you for joining me on Podcast Junkies. And thank you for having me. So for the benefit of the listener, where's home for you now? I'm in Scotts Valley, California. It's in Santa Cruz County. Okay. Beautiful central coast here. How's uh, it been with the wildfires? Well, last year in September, we were evacuated for something like 10 days. And it was in the midst of the COVID pandemic, of course. The only real place that we were able to go, though, was to my in-laws who are in their 80s. And so we were a little concerned about their health and whether or not we would be bringing with us any COVID pandemic. It was really rough. Yeah. Well, what's been the biggest aha or or awakening for you? Now we're a year and a half probably into things. And I think just personally for myself, I didn't realize how much I appreciated like 
in-person gatherings with friends. <laughs> and so it feels like now making up for lost time because my girlfriend and I are actively looking at uh, getting together with friends or putting, making sure there's always stuff on the calendar. I'm wondering what that's been like for you. Yeah, well, I honestly think it's part of the reason that I started my podcast in the first place. I had been in graduate school already limited in what I could do socially because I just didn't have any time. I had to work. I have two kids. And at the same time, I was in graduate school for my MBA. And so in the course of doing that, my social life got pretty dismal. And then the COVID pandemic hit. And then it was like enforced from the outside. And then everybody else was going through it with me. So I did long for human contact. I missed being able to go to the university events to network with other people. I missed seeing my friends, even in just like a chance encounter. And so I really kind of started this podcast for two reasons. Like the first one was that I felt like I wanted to put more good out into the world and kind of double down on all of my efforts and social impact and sustainability that I generally get to access through some of my work and also the donations or volunteerism that I do in my personal life. But I also was really missing that deeper connection with people. And so it comes out in interesting ways in some of my actual episodes. One of them relatively early on was with a, a gentleman who started this football club. It's a not-for-profit soccer or football club in North Wales called the North Wales Dragons. And he talked about the fact that your latrine was also the loo. And he kind of goes on and on and uses all these British colloquialisms for your kitchen is your this and on down the line. But <laughs> it all read so true because your entire life was within the walls of your home. And so being able to expand on that through podcasting and through making deeper connections with people around the globe really helped me. And I didn't realize how close to depression I was when I started this thing because it was like night and day. I suddenly just had more spring in my step. I felt better about life. I felt more connected on a global way to people that I felt I really enthralled in having met because it had been so long since I'd even met somebody new because of COVID. It's a reality. Yeah, that's a really good point because it's something that um, I don't think I was aware of as well. And my partner, I've talked about it because we essentially were stuck with each other in the same place, you know, for all that time. And I think for me, I'm in a new city. I'm in Minneapolis, but I grew up in New York and I've lived in LA. So starting like the friendship cycle here has been interesting and, and figuring that out. Because for me, the connections were at podcast conferences. And I was going probably to at least two or three a year. And that was my, over the course of, you know, four or five years, they start to become like a little bit of like your away family sometimes. Like it's like a high school reunion every year when you see them. And to have that taken away, obviously can't be, you don't realize how much you miss it, I guess, to, to your point, until you, you don't have it for an extended period of time. And to your point about mental health and depression. And I, I think nobody was prepared for how to handle this. So, you know, so kudos to, to everyone who's who's made it through. I lost my best friend from high school to COVID oh God. Um, about a month in. So yeah, it's been interesting to think about like losing close friends. So it, I feel like it's just been something that we needed in the form of a reset, but yeah, it, it sounds like for you as well, it's brought some things to the front that, uh, thankfully you've been able to address. Yeah. Well, interestingly, I just interviewed one of my dear friends for this podcast on Monday and she was an ICU nurse over the course of the last 15 months. She wrote a book called The Year of the Nurse. I just finished editing it before this call because I want to get it out right away. It literally dropped on Monday. So the book's now available written by Cassia Alexander or Cassandra Alexander, as it's called on the cover of this book and really kind of walks you through the pandemic from a nurse's perspective. So I just spent this last weekend kind of re-experiencing the COVID pandemic, but this time through the eyes of a nurse working in the ICU with COVID patients. And it was something else. It was really wow. revealing and certainly got you fired up. <laughs> I will say that. Yeah, it's exciting as a host when you get to have that interview. And then when you realize later on, for those that are editing their shows and they get to hear it. And it's almost like a reminder for you of like, wow, that, that was as good as I thought it was. And then you get really excited about sharing it with your audience as well. Yeah, I've transitioned to editing most of my own now. Initially, I had them produced externally. 
And I think that did a lot to save me time. But it's not like they would make the same stylistic choices that I might make editing them myself. So I find myself, as I get, let's say, just a little bit more comfortable with the medium, feeling more adept at making those judgments, cutting when it's unnecessary, you know, just uh, taking those leaps of faith and producing another piece. I'm also considering now kind of posting reflection pieces. So I'll get the episode out there and then do like a reflection piece where I say, you know, I've thought a lot about this podcast over the course of the last week. And here's my thoughts around X, Y, and Z, both as a way to refer back to good content, but also because once I get it out into the world, I tend to listen to it again. And I try to take the consumer's perspective, like how would they hear this listening to it for the first time? And it gets me thinking about it differently. The issue that I covered or, you know, some new idea I might have as a result of it. I also have been struggling to try and get to two podcast episodes a week, which can be a bit of a time challenge. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So, And for those uh, folks that have one a week and feel like they have their hands full, it gets very challenging. And depending what else you have going in your life or in your business (laughs) to, to keep that momentum going. But I thought it might be helpful for the listener to understand how you ended up here. You and I connected on LinkedIn. You joined a group that I have there called Podcasting for Thought Leaders. And I usually send a quick welcome note to folks. And then you mentioned that you had just dropped the trailer for the podcast. And then I think we were just talking about the launch. And it's interesting because I was like, what's been your biggest challenge so far? And you said, motherhood, work, graduate school, and power outages (laughs) at the time. It was a lot. So I did launch in January. But I literally had some crazy windstorms come through this neighborhood when I had guests booked. And all of a sudden, the power was out, and it was going to be out for a little bit. And then one of the people that I featured in an earlier episode um, is the CEO of Float Me, which is a company that does short-term payday loans, basically, but without being like onerous fees, almost a not-for-profit perspective. Like they aren't a not-for-profit, but pretty darn close, like purpose-driven, affordable, right? And they're based in the San Antonio, Texas area. And so the ice storms hit them the week I was supposed to be recording his podcast and, you know, they didn't have power for weeks on end. So it was just really interesting. It felt like at the time that I was launching, there were so many circumstances that were beyond my control that I had to navigate and just kind of roll with and understand, okay, well, maybe I wanted to go ahead and launch with three in the can at this particular time. Didn't quite work out that way. Got the trailer episode out and a couple of weeks later, my first episode hit. So since then, I've just been going strong with one episode a week and yeah, it's kept me busy for certain. And one of the things I asked you during that chat is that where you were at with the show and you had told me ju- you just gotten started. So I was really excited to see the topic and what you were working on. And I give you like the mini challenge. I said, well, when you hit 20 episodes, <laughs> you know, reach out to me and I'd love to invite you onto the show because I like people to like feel like they're striving towards something. But I can't tell you how many times I have made that offer and never heard anything back from people. <laughs> Either, you know, for whatever reason, something else is going on. Well, it was actually really helpful. You gave me a goalpost. And so as soon as I had that goalpost, I'm like, okay, so this person, I need to reach it once I've got to 20 episodes. And then it caused me to also do a little bit of reading. I was like, oh, most podcasts actually pod fade by episode seven. Like they don't exist beyond that. Seven, yeah. <laughs> and so I was just um, a little surprised at that, but since I launched and now looking back, I mean, Anchor and some platforms make it so easy for people to come on and just have some conversations, record them, put them out there. And then, you know, if they don't really have a clear strategy in mind, I could see how it would just fade into the background. That wasn't the intention with with which that I started this show. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that podcasters, new podcasters, at least underestimate the amount of time and effort to do it. And not only publish and be consistent, but to do it right, to be able to plan for content. There's so many moving parts and you have to be thinking about like who you're going to reach out to. And then there's that whole process of booking and scheduling and doing the recording. And then to your point, the editing and the marketing and the website, all these moving parts that sometimes when people think about a show, they just think about the conversation and to do it and to do it well, which it's, it's clear that you've, you've done from everything that I've seen. It takes a lot of um, planning and passion for the 
topic, I would imagine, because what's being covered on these episodes is something that's near and dear to your heart. Yeah. And the topics vary, but I do have to find the right person to interview to cover the particular thing, right? Like I can't talk about the life autistic without somebody who has autism and is dealing with the challenges of autism as an adult in today's life. I can't talk about what it's like to live in Ghana in the LGBTQIA plus community without talking to somebody who actually lives in Ghana and has experienced it in some way, you know, in their lives or who has supported others who are being subject to that kind of racism, sexism, you know, isms that we try to avoid here in the West. And I mean, literally living in a space where it's illegal to be gay. So I really look for people that can help me cover topics that are really near and dear to my heart, but also just that are rooted in making the world a better place, improving awareness around particular issues, because it's my firm belief that as we improve awareness, we're going to create a more just and equal world. It doesn't happen overnight. And, you know, there are communities around the globe that are raising up slowly and surely with their incomes coming up and with their ability to make choices about the foods that they eat and perhaps they'll stop littering as much and, 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 and. So, you know, that's really the root of the podcast, really trying to get people to care a little bit more so we can all be a little bit better. And it's a global effort. It's not just a regional backyard thing for me. That's part of the reason that I feature guests from around the globe. And I've spoken to people from, you know, Ghana, the UK, Nigeria, shoot, you know, into Asia. So really all over the place, many from the United States, some from my direct social circles, some from people I know, like Cassie Alexander, or, you know, even just the founder and president Howard Schiffer of the Vitamin Angels and the work that they're doing around the globe. Uh, So it's been just a real incredible journey thus far. And I'm just looking forward to the next chapter. Can you talk a little bit about your agency and the work that you're doing at a growing need and actually like the origin story of that, like how you ended up (laughs) founding that company? My work life. (laughs) So, Well, it it feels like there's a connection because I think from what I gather, the impetus for creating that and that energy, I think, is what's being carried through. And we we can talk a little bit further about that, but I think that what's being carried through into how you designed and and thought about the idea for the podcast. Yeah. So initially... I had thought that I was going to create a brand of products that I would offer to the world under a brand called Care More, Be Better. And that's not what ended up happening. I mean, this really is a social impact effort. It's more of a not-for-profit perspective. And so it's not directly tied to my work. But if you are to draw that line, it happens kind of like this. You know, I grew up in the natural products industry in a professional way, right? I started working straight out of college for an herbal extract company that created herbs that could be used in formulas that would help people's lives. And so I started formulating supplements in my early 20s with companies and then later building incredible brands like Nordic Naturals, where I reported directly to the CEO and essentially built the direct-to-consumer and retail-facing brand that everybody in the Omega-3 space knows and loves today. So I spent a decade doing that and, you know, was able to really push forward some really interesting not-for-profit or organized projects, including collaborations with the Vitamin Angels, who I feature in episode, I believe that was 20, and also water projects or inner city park projects, projects with veterans that supported veteran communities all through my work. And so I essentially started a growing need, which is essentially a sales and marketing organization that serves the needs, the growing needs of companies that are in the natural channel. And I build their plans for sales and marketing for them and often integrate not-for-profit connections, cause marketing partnerships and things along those lines, endemic to their brands so that they're able to grow and thrive and answer the needs of a consumer who wants to live well by doing good and also cares about where their money is going. 
And so that serves the natural channel, I think, really well, because that's where the headset of the natural channel consumer already is. And so I'm thrilled that I get to continue doing that work. I'm working on a primary project right now in the algae space. And I have a couple of other clients. One is a not-for-profit and I do their social media. But really, it's just my contractorship and I do subcontract to a few others that support the efforts of growing companies. Has this always been a passion for you as long as you can remember? Because if you look at the track record of the companies you work for, the initiatives you're working on. And I have been a user of uh, Nordic Nationals <laughs> in the past, and it's a reminder that I probably probably need to re-up my order of that. And so I'm wondering... Yeah, we all need to take fish oils. Like, do that or eat sen- uh, sardines, right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, and I have been eating sardines, so that's probably helping. But when you first got in there with the first company, I would imagine this is a topic that was has been a passion for you. And I'm wondering how far back you can trace that. Probably childhood. I'll give a for instance. You know, when I learned as a little kid that they were doing surgeries on rhesus macaques to remove their corneas and things along those lines to do studies on how, you know, you could create surgical solutions to blindness, as one example. I was really upset by that. I didn't like that they were doing this animal testing, basically making animals blind for the possibility that we might be able to go ahead and do corrective surgery on humans at a later date. So I remember at less than 10 years old, I was writing and getting petitions signed to send in to Congress. So it's almost like I just have always wanted to protect the underdog or to serve community in a way that I think is just kind of an idealistic approach to living. I was accused in high school of being an idealist, and I was told things like, oh, well, when you grow up, this will fall into the wayside. And I just never believed them. And I still don't believe them. There are always going to be naysayers who say, oh, with time, you will be more jaded or this or that. And I am in certain ways, but never when it comes to this perspective of wanting to live well by doing good and helping others around me to do the same, helping people to feel less of the Mount Everest syndrome, because I feel like each day, if we make small changes in how we approach living, then we can make a difference. And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be what feels like a Herculean effort. It can be something small, like even just refusing that plastic bag at the grocery store. And if we all collectively do something like that, then what happens? We push for more radical change. So that's just how I see things. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. (laughs) And they definitely should be because we definitely need more of that energy in this world with everything that we're seeing. And even just like those Netflix specials of like how what the impact of plastics on the oceans, which it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone at this point. But I think the more podcasts, the more people we have who can amplify other people's voices in this space, I think it's turning. It's probably like a you know a big ship turning very very slowly. But I think there's signs that more even younger generations are actually thinking about these topics, and you know I feel like those conversations are are happening more and more. Yeah. And I would agree with that. You know, I'm not recalling the exact episode, but I interviewed this gal, Kelsey Rumberg. She wrote this book called Trash to Treasure, which really is an invitation for companies to look at the economics of their waste and to try to reduce their waste streams and also find other uses for their waste, which it's an incredible effort to even write this book in the first place. So I interviewed her on the podcast. And one of the things that she said, that I found really surprising and which has changed my thinking is that the chip bag is the hallmark of our generation. And what she means by that is that this simple little chip bag that you get your some chips or your Doritos or whatever in that waste doesn't really break down. And so if you look at these videos of plastics in our ocean, that's what you see. You see a tons and tons of these chip bags. So now when I go to the grocery store, that is the last thing I buy. I will always buy something that is like the bulk size. And then I have reusable bags that I'll put those in for my kid's lunchbox. Now that change might just be small. It might be one thing that I'm doing, but it's one thing of a hundred things that I'm doing that will all make a measurable impact throughout my life. 
And if I'm living by that example and I talk about it with somebody and they think about it and go, wow, you know, I really don't want the chip bag to be the hallmark of our generation. Maybe I don't want to buy those single use, you know, individually packaged 100 calorie things anymore either. And I'll just be more mindful about the purchases I make. So, you know, that's what I mean by the power of small too. It doesn't have to feel huge. It can just be small steps that we take each day. Definitely having to rethink those as well <laughs> now because my mind is now cycling through that. And is that the single serving ones or but do you also apply that to like the big ones as well? I, mean, I think she's really talking about the single serving ones, but the reality is chip bags are generally made of the same thing. It's like a plastic coated mylar and they really don't break down. They don't break down in the oceans. They don't break down in landfill. They just kind of remain. And I mean, you've probably experienced how hard it is to rip open a chip bag, right? When you do, you know, sometimes you over <laughs> extend and shred the whole thing and chips end up everywhere. <laughs> yeah. and so a simple solution could be just buy the big chip bag. You know, it's going to be less material overall for what you're getting. Cut the top of, off of that, fill it little baggies of your own and, you know, use those. So how do you process all this information? Because I, I think about my partner, she's uh pretty empathic. So this type of stuff, like she thinks about that stuff a lot and she, she's really like loves animals. And so like if a bird hits the window here or it sounds like something did, she'll be like, she'll run outside and be like making sure that it's not startled. She used to work at the wildlife restoration project. And we actually just brought in a bunny <laughs> like three or four days ago that had been attacked by a cat. So I see firsthand like how that affects her personally in the course of making her way through this world. And so I'm wondering for you, like how you process that, how you deal with that. And because there's no shortage of, of things like that, that could be constantly roll around in your mind. Well, part of it is I do a podcast. <laughs> so, you know, it helps me to get it out into the world from my brain into the world. I'm really working to be as intentional as possible with the show the reality is I've had to turn some guests away that didn't really fit with the ethos of what I'm trying to do. And I just put a lot of effort into it. I mean, each episode might take me a total of 10 hours, let's say, with regard to networking, connecting with that person offline, making sure that they're a right fit, writing the questions, doing research to make sure I'm prepared for the interview, doing the interview, and then editing the interview. Sometimes I spend more time in editing than that even, but for the most part, that's about what I get through. But yeah, I really think it's important to just try to make small changes in your life. So if you are passionate about something and let's say it's the wildlife health in your neighborhood, I mean, you might even just make a small donation to a local not-for-profit that helps to fund them or donate your time. Both things can make a really big impact. Something you said that... Uh... I think is really interesting for folks that are thinking about starting a show who have a show who've been doing a show for years is this idea of a guest not fitting or a potential guest not fitting your ethos. So for the benefit of the listener and be interested as well, how would you describe the ethos of your show to someone who's interested in being a guest on it? Well, I really just have this simple metric I look for, and that's just, are they making a social impact about a particular issue or are they driving something that is really focused on sustainability? And if either of those things aren't met, I don't interview them. So there have been people who reached out to me, oh, well, this is a wellness coach and she helps businesses that are in their second generation do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, that's great. You know, I do feature some topics that are connected to business, but that's not my primary focus. And so there are plenty of podcasts out there that are very much directed at, you know, what it takes to run a successful business or, you know, really, I mean, you could do a Google search from there's hundreds of thousands of those, it seems. So I'm focused on social impact and sustainability. And even in the case where, you know, I was looking at interviewing my friend, Cassie Alexander, on the Year of the Nurse. I'm like, well, heck, COVID made a huge social impact on all of us. And understanding what it's like to be in the shoes of a nurse when you could end up in that hospital for this disease, that's important. And the effect of wearing a mask or not wearing a mask on the health of people around you that's pretty big deal too. So yes, this has a social impact, even if it's not the traditional topic I might cover on the show. 
So that's, that's just two examples I can think of. And what I love about that is it really helps you always keep your audience in mind. And this is something I talk about on my show. Like I've been doing it since 2014, but it always feels like I'm having a conversation that I want to have and that I'm always thinking about my audience and their curiosity. And so they know that if I'm curious and I'm interested in the guests and learning more about how they got to this point, that it'll, that's something that they're thinking of as well. And, and I think it's a, a little to what you spoke to because you're conscious of what your audience is coming for because based on how you've positioned the show and always, you know, thinking about what's going to serve the, the mission of what you're trying to achieve and also why people keep coming back is for these stories. So I, I just love that you're, you're, you're laser focused on it because I think that's, that's what separates out, you know, podcasts that don't have an ethos, you know, they'll just take anyone who wants to be on the show and they at some point just start to sound generic as you've alluded to. Well, and I've been tempted, you know, sometimes I just want to bring someone on to have a really cool conversation about something, but then I'm like, maybe I need to create a different podcast. Like I'll do a second podcast and then that one will be about X, Y, or Z. I've also been counseled by really smart people in media that even my show might be too broad a topic. And perhaps I should just do something on social impact or a particular take on social impact or a particular take on sustainability. And my response to that has been, no, because I need to be really interested. And the fact is that my interest kind of goes broad. And so even in that it is a specific show, the other piece that I try to consider as I look at interviewing somebody or covering a topic on the show is, does this fire me up? Because if it fires me up, that comes through the microphone and people, they come along for the ride. And if I'm not fired up about it, I feel it. I'm sure they feel it too, you know? Yeah, that's so important. It's what keeps you going and it's what keeps you excited to do the show because it, it, you know, there'll be ups and downs and there'll be days you don't feel like recording or don't feel like editing and, or don't feel like marketing, you know, fill in the blanks. But I think the excitement you get from the conversation and then from f feedback you get from listeners after you've put them out, I think is helps any and all podcasters who go through their ups and downs with their shows. Yeah. And that being said, I have interviewed people that I was a little less excited about. But then when we got into the interview, I was like, wow, that was a really interesting conversation. Like, there's something about, I think, turning the mic on, starting the recording, warming up and getting into a conversation that I think can change even your perspective as a host of a show. So I think if you approach it from the perspective of I'm here to have a good conversation with this individual, I've done enough research on their background. I feel like I can speak intelligently with them about X, Y, or Z, or at least draw out something intentional, then, then I think we'll have fun. And so far, that's been the case almost every time. So I'm feeling really good about it. I've actually gone back and listened to my first episodes. And where it's obvious that I'm not quite as comfortable behind the microphone, that's still good content. Like I feel proud of it. I'm glad it's out there. And so I just encourage people who are really interested in podcasting as a platform to, you know, get a microphone, start trying it out, record a couple things on Zoom just with some friends or family and play with it, get comfortable, and then just, you know, build your plan. Because if you don't have a plan, you're kind of adrift at sea without really any guiding compass. You don't know where you're going to end up. You don't know where you'll land. And you might just be one of those podcasts that pod fades by episode six. Uh, there's a lot of things in there. I want to threads. I want to pull. You talked about having, not knowing where the conversations go sometimes in the beginning. And I've experienced that as well. And I think what it's helped me to do is become a better listener and just be more curious and active listeners as well, because you have to really play off what you're getting from your guests in terms of energy level and, and education and just experience. And it's almost like the notes and the prep that you do are there as a backup. But, you know, to your point, there's a good percentage of the time that if you're doing those first things, like listening, being curious, you really won't have to refer to the notes because the conversation sort of takes on a life of its own. And, and it becomes exactly what I'm I've been referring to these more as instead of interviews as, as conversations, because that's what happens when people organically connect. So I don't know if you have a favorite show or two, but I do. And I'm not going to speak specifically and only of podcasting. Like Jerry Seinfeld did this show called Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee, 
right? And I don't know if you've listened to it. Yeah, I love that. After a while, it gets a little boring to me because I've watched so many of the episodes. I'm like, oh, I can see what's going to happen now. I, I bet I can pick the car he'd choose for this person and all that jazz. I'm a bit of a car nut. So I had fun with that one. But, you know, it was only semi-formulaic, right? Like the formula was the car and the coffee and the comedian. But other than that, they really just talked. And so, you know, understanding the art of conversation and perhaps having a frame of questions that you start with, that can be helpful. But sometimes I only ask like one or two that I had pre-canned. I do like to end with a particular question, which is, is there a question that I haven't asked that you wish I had? And so that one tends to get my guests to really think about all the questions I asked them up to that time. And then, you know, well, I really wish you'd asked me about X. And then it could be another 10 minutes of show after that. Or it might be just a, oh, no, but I really want them to, you know, go away from today's show thinking about X, Y, and Z. Great. Good way to wrap up. Good way to make sure I didn't miss something that could have been really an incredible gem. And it's proved to work most times. There's one interviewee who was like, where are you trying to go with this? <laughs> just like, well, I'm overthinking, trying to offer you the floor, but it's okay if you don't want it, you know, <laughs> and just edit that part out later. And it's funny with that question, because I've heard it asked before in shows. And there is a small percentage of people that will respond that way to that, because I think don't see the value in an answer coming back from that as well. So I think that's probably that percentage that you experienced. Yeah, maybe one in 10, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the other thing you talked about, which is really key and something we focus on with our agency is this idea of having a plan. So getting back into like a little bit of the nuts and bolts of it, like you're thinking about an idea. I imagine at this time you're listening to shows, so you're getting inspired by different formats and types of podcasts. So walk me through those early days of like how you're starting to think about what the show is going to be about and some of that planning. Okay. So I'm just going to laugh because I mean, the show that brought me into podcasting was my favorite murder. And it's a true crime podcast. It's probably one of the most popular podcasts that exists. But my friends have been telling me about it for a few years. And I was like, I don't want to listen to a show that's just about murder. Like that sounds really bleak. And I don't know, right? Yeah. And so then I started listening to it in November of last year. Now I started my podcast in January. So what does that tell you? Wow. <laughs> I literally binge listened to over 400 episodes of My Favorite Murder between early November and the time I launched my podcast. And so what happened for me was I was listening to these women tell stories without asking a ton of questions in between, but I was hearing them share their experience, their life experience, their thoughts, their perspectives about these atrocious things that had happened. And it got me thinking about all the times in my life that I've used a platform to educate public or that I've been a guest on a radio show to do interviews in the space of nutrition and omega-3s. And I realized uh, through the course of doing this that I already had the skill set to do a podcast. I already knew how to construct a conversation and get something educational put together I enjoyed listening to audiobooks and also to interview format stories. I often listened to Terry Gross on Fresh Air or to Car Talk on NPR. Those were two of my favorite shows as a much younger adult that I've listened to for, gosh, 20 years now. So I just think that I came to the podcast because I felt I wanted to really put more good into the world, social impact, sustainability. I knew I wanted to do that. I started to understand the format. I realized I could have control without being a slave to advertisers. Unlike people who are working in radio, unlike people who are working in TV. So I could utilize this tool as a way to build conversations that would get people thinking. And so that's what I chose to do. What's funny is the way you describe it, it's almost like you are already 
a podcaster, just not in name, because <laughs> you you sort of had been doing all the, the things and practicing the skills that one would need in order to be an effective podcaster. But I think just really the podcast, almost just all those pieces together that were already active and living in you. And I never considered it before I started listening to podcasts in November. I mean, I'd always listen to radio shows, but I'd even fallen out of doing that because who listens to the radio anymore? I um, really just listened to music on my Amazon music account or on Pandora or whatever, or Spotify. And I wasn't really listening to talk anymore. And I think that COVID changed that for a lot of people because of this sense of disconnection we had from one another. And I actually heard people say this on the My Favorite Murder chat boards and things like that. Like they literally felt like these women became their friends, even though they were only hearing them through a podcast. And I realized that I felt that way about Terry Gross. And I felt that way about the Car Talk Brothers, Click and Clack, right? I felt that way even... And I don't even want to say his name, so I'm not going to, but another, you know, disc jockey, let's say, you know, you almost felt like you knew them. And I felt like if I could do that through my podcast and help somebody else along and make them feel more connected, then great. I'm doing something else. Even if I'm only, you know, reaching a small audience, I'm reading it, reaching a small audience that cares. I think that's the important part because people, when they get into it, if they get into it for the wrong reason, I think they start to get too concerned with like download numbers and, you know, get, you know, how do I get to thousands, tens of thousands and get my sponsors? And it's a bit like putting the cart before the horse because, you know, just delivering that message to a small group of people who return week after week to listen to your show. I remember when I started speaking to podcasting conferences, they would use the example of, okay, if you're only getting 150 listeners on each episode and you start to complain, have you thought about the fact of putting those 150 people in a room like every week and you are there in front of the room talking to them and sharing those experiences. You just never know who is listening and is going to be impacted. And it's like something I've said when I've, I've spoken at, at, at conferences on stage, like I'm just happy impacting one person, like regardless of how many people are in the room or in the audience, like if just like one person thought differently about something that I said, I'll feel like I've, I did what I was supposed to do. And, and I, I think about that way in my podcast episodes as well. Yeah, well, I have a background in anthropology. That was my undergrad, right? And Margaret Mead, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember the quote exactly, but she has this quote where it essentially says, never forget that a small group of inspired individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And so I think about that. That keeps me motivated. And the reality is that, you know, I think my top podcast thus far has had about 500 downloads, that single episode. And I'm pretty enthralled by that. I think that's pretty darn good for a single episode, given that I'm about six months old in all actuality. I launched my trailer episode in January, and it was mid, mid-February before I launched any after that. But the reality is like, I can't necessarily talk to 150 people live with that frequency. So if I'm able to reach that many over the course of a podcast being out there, then fantastic. I still get people going back to my trailer episode. So that seven minute clip that was about what this show is intended to be. I look back at that now. I'm like, I probably need to edit that first podcast because I didn't actually release the episodes in the order that they were mentioned in there. But then I'm like, does it really matter? I mean, they'll listen, it'll be fine. So I'm trying not to be a perfectionist. That's the other thing, trying not to be a perfectionist about the podcast, because I don't know that they're ever perfect. And I think that's part of their beauty. So well put, so well put. Yeah, I think I have to revisit my trailer. It's really old in <laughs> at least three or four years now that you mentioned it. So, and then it's, it's a good practice when you change seasons or even like three to six months, you should really be refreshing it because you're going to get new listeners all the time. I mean, I say in every episode, if you're new to the show, this is the one where I speak to you know interesting folks in the podcasting space. So the fact that I do that on an episode means that I probably should be revisiting that trailer. I'd be remiss if I didn't just as a quick aside, ask you what your dream car is. There's, there's like 50 of them. (laughs) I really, really like the Ferrari Dino for its simplicity, its beauty of design, and the fact that it was kind of a lay person's Ferrari. 
I had the chance to buy one used a few years ago for like $16,000 and didn't do it. And I look back on that day several times over and I'm like, you know, I should have just bought it. I had the money. Why didn't I just do it? And the reality is then you have to garage it. Then you have to have a mechanic you trust. Then you have to, then you have to, then you have to. And I wasn't at a point in my life at that space. I was in my late twenties, I think, but I didn't have a garage. And I felt like a garage was a precursor for a Ferrari, even if it was only the layperson's $16,000 vehicle. So I didn't make that choice, but I still think about that one. (laughs) And so do you like the Jay Leno show as well? I have a love-hate relationship with Jay Leno. I think he's really fantastic in several ways. And then, you know, he's just a little extreme. But I do love his love of cars. And I have seen him talk at Concourse d'Elegance in Pebble Beach. I snuck in there a few times because I didn't like paying the $250 entry fee through the (laughs) golf cart entrance and service entrance. Oh, wait, this is out there now. I don't think anyone's going to come arrest me, though. So, you know. Yeah, I did see him there. And he does have an excellent collection of cars and a giant garage that's probably built to display them like a museum. Very nice. So now I'm (laughs) curious about this love for cars. Does that just go far back as well, as far as you can remember? Oh, I get that from my dad. I feel like it was the way that we bonded when I was little. He always had like five or 10 vehicles. And I literally say five or 10 vehicles. Maybe a couple of them would run well, and then the others would be a crapshoot. But, you know, they weren't always the nicest of vehicles, but he was always tinkering with them. The car I learned to drive in is a MG Model B that he worked on. He still has it. He wants to pay it forward to me to give it to me. And he's like, well, honey, I don't know if I could drive it over the hill. I'm not confident in the brakes. I live in Santa Cruz. He'd have to drive over a mountain. I'm like, yeah, maybe we should wait. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. That's a nice memory. And it's a nice, I mean, I remember my dad showing me how to change the oil. I think we changed the shocks once and the brakes. And so in the garage, just like hands on how to figure that out. I don't know that I could do that. And I think the cars today are so complicated. I probably (laughs) don't want to even try, but it's nice that. Yeah, it's not as easy as it once was. I mean, I started racing cars at the track too. So I was doing that for a while, but only cars I could still work on. So I had like a Mazda Miata and I did track days at Thunder Hill, Sears Point, Laguna Seca, you know, a few others. And it was just a lot of fun. But still, even that car in 99 was a 2001 Mazda Miata. Everything's covered in panels. You have to, you know, spend quite a bit of time with your wrench, just getting all the panels off to get to the motor. And I think that has both been done to keep consumers who don't know what they need to know about the computers and the inner workings of the car from trying to do it as much as it is to keep mechanics employed. That's true. True. Yeah. My partner actually loves driving stick shifts. (laughs) She makes like whatever car she's their last three or four, they've all been manual. Hard to find now, really hard to find. Yeah. A couple of questions as we wrap up. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? I am considering whether I'm more moderate than liberal. So I haven't changed my mind about that, but I've it's been revealed to me that I might take things on more of a, a case-by-case basis than I even thought. So I'm constantly considering the information I receive when I'm looking at how I think about things, which I think is good. That's progress for anybody, but I also lean back on that perspective of not wanting to lose my idealism. So, you know, is it idealistic to consider yourself, you know, on one side of the spectrum versus the other? I don't know, but there's something of this like bleeding heart liberal Karina that grew up in, you know, a hippie commune that balks at the idea that I might be more centrist in my perspective. That's a really interesting point. And I think I've been you know, digging into stuff like stoicism lately and the sense-making world, metamodern, I don't even know how to describe some of this, like higher philosophical philosophical discussions about what's happening and how to what it means to have agency about your decisions and to be a, a rational thinker about each and take each problem on its own merits and then make a decision with all the information that you have and, and feel like you, you can have an intelligent discussion and make an informed decision based on your own knowing of it as opposed to what other people are telling you. So I think part of the, the result of what we've gone through the past four to six years, I think is 
forcing people to, to figure out if they just want to continue to be fed their the opinions that they should feel or actually start to think for themselves about what's the right thing to do in each moment. Yeah, I mean, and I have always tried to read all sides of a story. It's been harder and harder to find the truth because so many, well, basically because news has become, become entertainment. And because news has become entertainment, we don't get the same kind of journalistic approach to most news items. We get opinion pieces that are encapsulated as news, but they aren't really news. So I find myself going to Reuters and BBC World News and things like that to try and get a more broad perspective. And really, I'm spending less time in social media. I try not to read any news on social media. I'll go to sources. And it takes work to have that discipline to do that and also to place it as something of importance in your life because the masses are, you know, being eaten potato chips in single serve containers and, you know, throwing plastics in the ocean and not really getting spoon fed all of like this media, the news, the TV shows. And for lack of a better example, I mean, it is like the, everyone just plugged into the matrix and not realizing they're, they're in the, <laughs> the simulation. And I think when, when you start to have conversations with people. Yeah. Why is it always a choice though? Like blue pill, red pill. Why does it have to be one or the other? Like you have to be left or right. Yeah. I think that's a disservice too. So, you know, I'm really just trying to keep my lens focused on the things I care about most, which is social impact, sustainability. They do tend to be, you know, topics that are more left than right, but I don't think that they are, they should be politicized the way they are. I really don't, you know, humanitarian concerns should be the concern of everybody. Absolutely. Having a healthy environment to live and breathe in should be the concern of everybody. These are things that should be the rights of each of us. And it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't be politicized. That's my problem with kind of politics in general, I guess. Yeah, we're going through some interesting times. And, and it's been interesting for me just to educate myself about, you know, <laughs> our history and, and what we've done and how we're just repeating the same mistakes and over. So that it feels like we could have another hour conversation on just that topic. Well, I'm happy to come back anytime. <laughs> <laughs> What's uh, the most misunderstood thing about you? I'm very driven. And I like to be productive. And so sometimes I'm not as friendly with my asks when it comes to work life or even personal life. Like I just get right to the point. And I think sometimes people perceive that to be abrasive or for lack of a better term, bitchy. And I'm really not those things. I just don't like to spend a lot of time on social niceties. It feels superfluous sometimes. And so I think that's a misunderstanding that some people have about me. I interviewed this incredible individual, Hunter Hansen, for my <laughs> podcast. It just went live today. He has this podcast, uh, it's a YouTube show and also Instagram show called The Life Autistic. And it has me questioning whether I might be on the spectrum myself, because apparently these are traits that are very common with people who have autism, that they just, in that social perspective, have trouble. And it's always been the case for me. Yeah, it's interesting. I was just having this discussion with someone a couple of weeks ago about how much they hate small talk. <laughs> like it absolutely drives them bananas and they can't do it. Yeah. I mean, it's tough for me. I like to talk about something that's meaningful. And so, you know, even just that initial, you know, how's the weather type thing. <laughs> very cool. Well, Karina, thanks so much. This is very entertaining. I love when I just follow my impulses with random conversations. And then I, I was just inspired by the work that you're doing. And I just had a feeling that uh, just by the nature of what you had done up until that point with the podcast, that this was something that was serious for you, that you were passionate about. And then it just made sense that if, if and when you did get to that 20, that we would have a, a really good conversation. And, and uh, well, I've really enjoyed this too. It wasn't disappointing. I really had a fun time. Yeah, me too. So much fun. Where's the best place for folks to subscribe to the show and learn more? Well, you can just go to the podcast website itself, caremorebebetter.com, or you can find me on social spaces under the same moniker. It's caremore.bebetter on Instagram or caremorebebetter on Facebook. Basically, I try to make it available wherever you might listen. So it is available wherever you listen to podcasts. 
And I put all the links in show notes anyways. So you should be able to find me fairly easily. You can also just send me an email to hello at caremorebebetter.com. That's where I would receive any requests to be a guest or things along those lines as well. So thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thanks again to Karina for coming on the show. Don't forget to check out the full show notes at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 272. Special thanks to our sponsors, Focusrite, makers of the Scarlet 2i2 Pro. Find out more at podcastjunkies.com forward slash Focusrite. Special thanks to this week's podcast sponsor, Patreon. Over 25,000 independent podcasters have found a home on Patreon, where your listeners subscribe to your show for access to exclusive content and benefits, while you earn reliable income independent of ads. Start your Patreon today at patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. Tune in next week for my conversation with Agnes Cozera, co-founder of Podcorn. If you made it this far, you're waiting for their attention hashtag. Let's go with Care More Corina. C-A-R-E-M-O-R-E-C-O-R-I-N-N-A. And you can tag Karina at Care More Be Better. That's C-A-R-E-M-O-R-E-B-E-B-E-T-T-R. And podcast underscore junkies. Thanks for all you do to support the show. Talk to you all next week.